All right, hi everybody. It's Monday evening and just getting around to doing the lecture. Um, hopefully we'll have some more consistency as things go on. I'm just finishing up my other class at Mesa and a few things, my son with his classes. So um, eventually we'll get a consistent time frame. but I wanted to go ahead and at least do this lecture and send it to you and then um, um, take it from there. So just to give you an idea of what we're gonna be doing today, The plan is we're going to do muscle one. Then on Tuesday, we'll do muscle two. And Wednesday will be exam review. Um, and you guys already did get a copy of the study guide, so hopefully you're already starting to look at that. And then Thursday, um, we will be having the actual exam. Um, still working out the times and the details. Um, I will be giving you guys a window of time to do it in, just because of obviously everyone has scheduling issues and things to do at home and, and other things. So. Um, I will get back to you on that, but there will be a window. It won't just be like, you know, two to three. It'll be a window. Those of you um, who need accommodations, I will pre be providing that to you. Um, and um, go ahead and contact me again, just so I know who you are. I already did get an email from one of you. So um, if anyone else needs those accommodations, please let me know. All right. Let's talk about, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's go to, there we go, whiteboard, and new share, there we go. All right, so today we're gonna to start talking about muscle um, as a nice follow-up to the nerve and sensory. Um, figured I have a picture of a rabbit here, which is kind of a good, Example of showing what muscles do. Obviously, movement and rabbits are a good example of an animal that does have a lot of mobility. All right, so when we talk about muscle, just like every other tissue in the body, um, muscle has particular functions. Um, with the nervous system, remember we spoke about communication, you know, input, processing, output. In terms of muscle, the functions are primarily movement, right? Um, now, when I talk about movement, that can be things like moving our arms and legs. That can also be things like our heart beating, right? Now, that's a different muscle, different type of muscle, cardiac muscle, um, but it still has an important function in movement. Also, we have a type of muscle that's present in our digestive tract and our urinary tract to help move food, move urine along. So it's all involved in movement in some way. Um, muscle, at least with skeletal muscle, which is really the primary focus today, helps to maintain posture, helps to stabilize joints such as our shoulder joints, knee joints, and it also generates heat. A good example is shivering. Now, anytime you have a tissue or an organ that has a particular function, there's gotta be a reason it can do that. Remember, nerves are primarily designed to carry information, to conduct impulses. They have to have certain properties, right, with action potentials and certain features of that cell. In the case of muscle, the reason why the muscle is involved in all those previous functions is because, first of all, it's excitable. Any muscle is not the only excitable tissue. Nerves are also. But anytime you have an excitable tissue, it means that it responds to a stimulus in a certain way. With nerves, the response to a stimulus is generating an action potential releasing neurotransmitter. In the case of muscle, the response is contraction or movement. So how does muscle move? It can either what we call contract or the muscle tissue will shorten. That allows us to move our arms and legs and our heart beating. Muscle can also stretch. 
and it's also elastic, meaning that once it's stretched, it goes back to its original size. Once it shortens, it goes back to its original size. So it has this elasticity to it. This, of course, should be a picture you're familiar with. This is an example of a neuromuscular junction. Um, and of course, nerves control the function of skeletal muscle. We'll take a look at how they do it shortly. All right, so muscle. So like I mentioned, the primary focus of this topic is on skeletal muscle. The muscle we think of with moving our arms and legs, writing, turning our head. But the fact is there are three types of muscle. And they, they're structurally different. They're similar in the sense that they all are involved in movement, but they're, they're structurally different. First of all, with skeletal muscle, it's called skeletal because it's attached to bones. Um, Shape-wise, a skeletal muscle cell is cylindrical, very different from a nerve cell. Right, very long. If you think of like the end of a roll of paper towel, that cardboard roll, except it's not hollow, it's filled in with stuff. Um, that's kind of what a skeletal muscle cell looks like. It's cylindrical, it's striated, which is what these stripes look like, or look like doing right here. And it's also multinucleated. Normally, whenever we think of a cell, we think of cells, one nucleus, one cell. In the case of skeletal muscle, that's not the case. More than one nucleus per cell. Skeletal muscle is considered voluntary in the sense that we kind of have to initiate willfully a movement. Raising our hand, writing stuff down, walking, right? Um, and it's under the control of the somatic branch of the peripheral nervous system. Let's take a look out of, at the cardiac muscle. So even though the cardiac muscle also moves, is responsible for movement, it's a bit different. First of all, similarities with skeletal muscle are that it is striated, yes, um, but instead of being cylindrical, the cells are branched. You see how they're kind of like splitting off? They're branched and they also have one nucleus per cell. In addition to that, they have these specialized structures that we don't find in any, any other cell called intercalated discs. These are essentially um, boundaries between cells that have gap junctions in them that allow, once one muscle cell is stimulated to contract, it communicates with the next cell. So it allows these cells to be in constant communication with each other because there's gap junctions, allow information to go from one cell to the other. Functionally, cardiac muscle, what does it do? It pumps blood. Um, it's considered to be self-excitatory, meaning that as opposed to, the, to skeletal muscle, which is what we call neurogenic, depending on the nervous system, cardiac muscle does not require the nervous system. It can beat on its own. However, the nervous system and hormones can influence it. For example, when we're stressed, fight or flight, right? Our heart beats faster. Um, even without nerve input, the heart would still beat. In contrast to skeletal muscle, without nerve input, the muscle would atrophy. It wouldn't function at all. Smooth muscle. Very different looking muscle. Um, doesn't look anything like the other two. The only similarity with one of them is that it has a single nucleus in each cell. However, you don't see any striations and the cells are kind of spindle shaped, kind of like tapered. We find this lining um, different tracts or passageways, lining the respiratory tract, lining the um, digestive tract, urinary tract. This is also involuntary, meaning that it's going to contract whether we think about it or not, just like the heart. Uh, it also can contract, it can contract on its own. It's self-excitatory, but also like the heart, it can be influenced by um, nerves and hormones. So these are the muscles that are responsible for peristalsis, moving of food, also responsible for bronchospasms and people who have asthma. So this is a little quick summary of the muscles in terms of some characteristics. 
Um, skeletal and cardiac are both striated. Smooth muscle is not. Skeletal muscle is voluntary. The other two are not. They're involuntary. All right. I'm not going to go through all of these different descriptions, um, but I did want to go through a couple of the different characteristics of the three major types of muscle. Um, here you see it shows four. There are two types of smooth, but we're going to kind of just lump, just take a look at just one type, the multi-unit, which is really the most common. Um, you can see the structure between skeletal, cylindrical, multi-unit small, spindle, cardiac branched, right? Um, what are some, some of the other characteristics? Um, skeletal muscles innervated by the somatic branch, whereas the cardiac muscle and, and smooth muscle do have autonomic input, but again, they do have the ability to function um, on their own when without nerve input. This can just basically influence it, whereas with skeletal muscle, you do require that nerve input. Um, a lot of these other things, I'm not gonna worry about these now because we're gonna cover as we go along and then we'll kind of summarize at the very end. These are all properties that explain why these different types of muscles um, have different ways that they contract. All right. For now, the focus is going to be on skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle is as an organization that we call hierarchical, meaning that within each muscle, and if you think of biceps, triceps, quadricep muscles, trapezius, this is the whole muscle. Within each muscle, we have individual what we call bundles that are called fascicles. So one muscle itself, one whole muscle, which is connected to a bone, consists of many fascicles. Each fascicle contains many what we call muscle fibers, which are muscle cells, for example. So this, this right here is a muscle cell. So whole muscle, fascicle, muscle cell, Within each muscle cell, we have another level consisting of what we call myofibrils, which are these structures right here. Within each myofibril, we have filaments that we call thick and thin filaments. Okay, this is just another close-up view of it so you can see how it's organized. Um, I did want to mention within each level of organization, there's a wrapping of connective tissue. So if this is the whole muscle, it's wrapped in a layer of connective tissue called epimysium. Within that whole muscle, remember we have these individual fascicles, which is this, this, and this. These are wrapped in a layer of connective tissue called the paramysium. So this is whole muscle. These are individual fascicles. Here's the epimysium. Surrounding each fascicle, we have paramysium, which is what we're looking at right here. Within each fascicle, we have individual muscle fibers or muscle cells that are wrapped in a layer of connective tissue called the endomysium. So epi, peri, endo. Within each muscle fiber, we have what are called myofibrils which we saw before. So we're gonna take a look at some of the anatomy and eventually the physiology of this. All right. So mu muscles are made up of fascicles. Fascicles are made up of muscle fibers. Now, um, muscle fibers is just another name for a muscle cell. So when I say muscle fiber, I'm just referring to a cell. And just like any cell, muscle cell consists of all the typical organelles, or at least some of them. We have a cell membrane which is known as a sarcolemma. The prefix sarco means muscle. Um, we have nuclei. This is showing one, but actually there's many. Uh, we do have a lot of mitochondria. You've heard of those before. So a lot of the similar organelles, although we have some different ones. We have what makes up a good proportion of a muscle fiber is this tubular structure, which is known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum. And I know you guys have heard of 
um, endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum, which is a tubular network that's involved in protein synthesis, protein transport, um, synthesis of lipids, things like that. The purpose of this sarcoplasmic reticulum is that it stores and releases calcium. So it's very special in muscle. We, we also have these tubes right here, which are known as T-tubules or transverse tubules. Now what's going on here, just to kind of give you a, a, an idea of how the anatomy is, here we've got the, the cell membrane. These T-tubules are essentially invaginations of the cell membrane that go into the interior of the cell. Now the purpose for that is, as we start talking about muscle contraction, a muscle cell is a very uh, large cell. And when a muscle cell is stimulated to contract, if you don't have a way of getting the stimulus into the interior, only the surface will contract. We need to get the entire muscle contracting. That's where the T tubule. So they're kind of the mess, they're kind of carrying the signal into the interior. And as we'll soon see, it's an electrical signal from the nerve. All right, so we've seen all these organelles, especially focusing on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, stores and releases calcium when needed, the T-tubules which carry the electrical impulse into the interior. The overwhelming bulk of the inside of a muscle cell or muscle fiber is made up of these round structures known as myofibrils. And we're gonna take a look at this, but there's many, many myofibrils within a muscle cell. And it's at this level that we actually st see the movement that's going to be responsible for the entire muscle here. Oops, that's contracting. All right. All right, so this is a, a similar picture, just a close up view here is the whole muscle cell, here's all these myofibrils. Here's the sarcoplasmic reticulum, T-tubules. Now you notice all these interesting little dots from the side, kind of a brown and a blue. Well, if we look at them from a different view, we can see these lines that represent what we call myofilaments. We'll be talking about those shortly. That's what we refer to when we're talking about thick and thin filaments of skeletal muscle that are gonna be involved in contraction. All right, here we go. So here's our myofibril. So just to kind of back up for a second, right? We've gone from whole muscle, the fascicles, to muscle fibers. Now we're looking right within those myofibrils, inside a, a muscle fiber, and we're gonna take a look at thick and thin filaments. Okay, so here is our myofibril. And here's a close-up view of these, this organization. Now, one of the first things I want to mention with the myofibril is that it contains a specific order or a pattern. You see these little zigzag lines? These are known as Z-discs or Z-lines. From one Z-disc to the other is what we call a sarcomere. And a sarcomere is the functional basic unit of a muscle. That's the smallest functional unit of a muscle. When these muscle cells stimulated to contract, this is what happens. This movement occurs right here. I'm not gonna go through all the A bands, the H bands, the I bands, just because it's a fast moving class. And I, I'm gonna focus on, I think, some more important issues um, regarding the, the sarcomere. But for now, when we take a look at this, this sarcomere, we've got these zigzagging lines, which are called Z-discs. Within them, we have these very thick-looking fibers. These are what we know call the thick filaments. What you see in blue are the thin filaments. And what's going to happen when the muscle contracts, which we'll talk about, is those thick and thin, I don't know if you can see it. Well, here we go. When the thick and thin filaments, they're gonna overlap each other like this, and we'll explain how. I'm kind of going backwards to kind of bring you to the story, to where the story begins. All right, so the sarcomere, sarcomere is the functional unit of muscle contraction. The Z-disc or the Z-line 
forms the boundary between adjacent sarcomeres. So here's Z disc to Z disc. So we're gonna take a look at this one sarcomere. What you see in green, this is our thick filament. What you see in kind of purple is our thin filament. Now, what we no normally notice in a sarcomere is that these filaments overlap each other. You notice that here, they're not separate, but these, there's an overlapping here, an overlapping of these two here. And it's the overlapping, the increased amount of overlapping of the filaments is what occurs during contraction. All right. So now that we've established thick filaments and thin filaments, um, that's kind of generic. What is, what are they made up of? Thin filament is made up primarily of the protein actin, which are these purple spheres that are forming kind of a helix arrangement. Even though that's the primary backbone of the thin filament, we also have these little, looks like spaghetti strands structures. This is a protein called tropomyosin. In addition, we have a golden kind of oval structure called a protein known as troponin. These three proteins make up the thin filament, and we're going to take a look at some interesting interactions between the, pro the, the proteins between each of them on the thin filament, how they interact, and also the interaction between the thin filament and this thick filament, which is the protein myosin. This myosin molecule is made up of two parts, what we call the myosin head, and the remaining part, which is the myosin tail. Kind of looks like a golf club. What's going to happen in muscle contraction, what causes the, the overlapping of the filaments, is going to be interaction between the myosin head and actin, which is essentially going to pull. It's kind of hard to see, but I'll show you on a diagram. The myosin head is going to pull on the actin, which is going to cause these um, um, overlapping to increase. All right, here's another view of it. Um, so here we can see our, our actin, our tropomyosin, and then what we see in orange is troponin. On the myosin, here's the tail and here's the head. Now, anytime you have two proteins interacting with each other, there's got to be a reason they interact. There's got to be some um, binding activity or binding interaction. On the myosin head, we have an actin binding site. And on the actin, although it doesn't label it, we have a myosin binding site. So these two are going to interact with each other. We also have another important site on the myosin head, and that's an ATP binding site. This is where we have an enzyme called ATPase that's responsible for breaking down ATP to generate energy. And mu uh, muscle contraction is a very energy expensive mechanism, and we'll soon see how that works. All right. <clears throat> so before we get actually into the mechanics of contraction, I want to elaborate a bit on the nervous system involvement with muscle contraction. As I mentioned, skeletal muscle is absolutely 100% dependent on a nerve telling it what to do. Something happens to that nerve, like can happen with some neurodegenerative diseases, the muscle not only won't contract, but it will atrophy. So as we know, the part of the peripheral nervous system that is involved here is a somatic branch of the peripheral nervous system, which consists of myelinated axons that release acetylcholine at the muscle. And we're all familiar with acetylcholine, with Receptors, here we're talking about a nicotinic receptor. We're not going to worry about the autonomic system right now. All right. Some other terms to become familiar with when we're talking about the relationship between skeletal muscle and nerves is the term motor units. Motor units, by definition, consists of a single neuron and all the different muscle fibers it innervates. So you might, you might think it's going to be kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, right? We've got a dendrites 
a cell body, his axon is going to come down and innervate one muscle fiber. But as you can see right here, most neurons, we didn't see it before, but most neurons have several different axon terminals. This happens to have five. So this whole, this interaction with these five muscle fibers, this is a motor unit. Um, I put the B in there because it's got some very rapidly acting flight muscles. This is another motor unit. This myelinated axon is innervating three muscle fibers. So it's it. So mu a neurons innervate muscle fibers. All motor units are not the same. It depends where you are in the body and what their function is. We have small motor units and large motor units. A small motor unit is a, is a situation where you have a single neuron that innervates maybe a few muscle fibers. So going back to this, oops. Ah. This would be an example of a small motor unit. Okay, maybe five fibers. Um, this, is not, this is not going to generate much in the way of contraction or power. This is more in terms with, of, of allowing for precise movements. Like for example, our fingers, and our eye muscles, right? There are muscles there, but we don't think of those muscles as generating much force, and they don't. They're there for precision, kind of fine motor movement with the eyes and the fingers. You can have, which we do have, large motor units, which a single neuron can innervate thousands, maybe up to a thousand or 2,000 individual muscle fibers. And you can imagine the amount of muscle fibers that are being stimulated by that one neuron with all of its branches, that's going to generate a lot of force. So this is where we're looking at things like the biceps, the quadriceps, the gastrocnemius or the calf muscles. They consist of large motor units. All right. Neuromuscular junction. So speaking about nerves, and this is a bit of a review. Um, remember, of course, that Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that stimulates muscle contraction. Here's our chemical synapse, consisting of synaptic vesicles containing acetylcholine. When an action potential comes down, remember this stimulates the opening of calcium channels, which eventually with synapsins trigger the exocytosis of acetylcholine, which binds to the nicotinic receptors which is then going to trigger a um, wave of depolarization, an influx of sodium. At the same time, of course, after acetylcholine does its thing, it's recycled by acetylcholinesterase. Now, there's a name for everything. And the muscle, part of the muscle membrane, the part of the sarcolemma, where you have nicotinic receptors is called the motor end plate, right? So this would not be the motor end plate, this would not be a motor end plate, but right here would be. Excuse me, my allergies are driving me nuts today. All right, so we know that nerve stimulates the muscle, muscles to contract, but what is the, the mechanism? I mean, we know obviously acetylcholine is going to be released, depolarize the membrane, but what happens from that point until the muscle actually shortens? So let's take a look at it. Okay, so when we talk about muscle contraction, the whole process is known as the sliding filament theory. Um, I should rephrase that, it's really no longer a theory, it's the sliding filament law, really. I mean, it's, it's known, it's a fact, okay? And when a muscle is stimulated to contract, what actually happens is the actin and myosin cross bridge or basically interact with each other that ultimately will pull the actin towards the center. I'm going to show you a video of this a little bit later. Okay, so sliding filament theory is used to describe the mechanism of contraction because that's essentially what's happening is the filaments are sliding past each other and shortening and the sarcomere is getting shorter. All right, so let's take a look at a, a good example of a couple sarcomeres before contraction or relaxed and after contraction. 
Um, here we can see our Z disks. Here, let's just take a look at this one sarcomere, for example. And here we can see the thick filament here and the thin filament there. When the muscle is stimulated to contract, notice a couple things. Notice, number one, the sarcomere, which was this long before, is now shorter. So the sarcomere decreases in size. Notice another thing. Notice the overlap of actin and myosin. There's a little overlap. There's a greater overlap. So those are two key things that are, that are happening. The sarcomere is getting shorter because the Z lines are coming closer, and along with that, or because of that, actin and myosin are overlapping more. All right. So we know myosin um, has a site on it called the, uh, an ATP binding site, right? And we know ATP is the energy currency of a cell. So how does ATP work? in muscle contraction. All right, so I'm gonna first show you, I think, the text, and then we're gonna come back because it can be a little bit confusing. All right, so the first thing I wanna mention is, think of it at the very end, what it's going to happen in muscle contraction is the myosin head is going to move and interact with actin and pull on it. Okay, that's what's gonna happen at the very end. Before that happens, what exactly is occurring is the presence of ATP inside of a cell inside of the, on the myosin is going to split ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. The ADP and the phosphate remain attached to the myosin until eventually the phos phosphate is released, which allows the myosin to move and attach to the actin. This is what we call the power stroke. After the power stroke, ADP detaches and another, another ATP binds to it, causing the cross bridge to break, cross bridges detach, ready to bind again. Okay, so let me go back for a second, really quick to this picture. Uh, so what's actually happening with contraction is when the muscle is stimulated to contract, ATP binds to here, it's broken down to ADP and phosphate. Phosphate's released. This myosin head then interacts with actin. And that causes the, and it actually pulls on the actin to shorten the sarcomere. And this is everything that I just mentioned, but just showing it in a picture format. So basically here we've got, um, here we have ATP attaching to the myosin. You know, the myosin and actin aren't interacting with each other. The ATP binding to it is energized, releases ADP and phosphate by the ATPase. Once the phosphate is released, this triggers the, what we call the power stroke, where you notice the myosin is interacting with actin, pulls on it, and you notice, see that arrow? It's pulling the actin, and that causes the power stroke. Eventually what happens, the ADP is released, a new ATP comes in and the cycle starts all over again. So I'm gonna show you a video at the end of this, uh, which I think will help explain it as well. All right, so we've mentioned a couple of things with muscle contraction, that at the end of it all, myosin, the myosin head binds to actin, right? Forming a cross bridge, pulling on actin to shorten the sarcomere. Well, as ADP or ATP. Well, if that's the case, we always have ATP. So why isn't the muscle always contracted? If we have ATP, why isn't it always contracted? The reason for that has to do with calcium. Remember I mentioned that calcium is found within the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Well, this is what happens. This is, for example, a muscle in a, in a resting state, all right? When I say resting, it's not contracting yet. We still have the ATP, ADP and phosphate attached. Notice a couple things. Notice that we have the, the actin, we have the tropomyosin, we have the troponin. We notice that the myosin, even though it would love to bind to actin, can't because the binding site is covered. Tropomyosin is covering the binding site. So that thereby myosin cannot bind to actin. However, 
when cal the way calcium works, and this happens when the muscle is stimulated to contract by a nerve, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, binds to troponin, and when it binds to troponin, the troponin pulls on the tropomyosin that moves it out of the way that allows the myosin to bind to actin. So it's a steric thing. So you need calcium to expose the binding site. Without calcium, the myosin might try to bind to the actin, but it can't. Okay. This is just a quick little video. It's, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this. I may have to, let's see, hold on a second. I may have to do another screen share here. Let's see, new share. Um, all right. So it's a fast moving vi video. Unfortunately, there's only one speed. But if you take a look, these golden spheres are actin. The blue is the tropomyosin. The magenta is troponin. This is the myosin tail, the myosin head. And you notice there's also a gold sphere that comes down. You notice every time the gold sphere comes down, that's calcium, it moves the troponin, moves the troponin, moves the troponin, and then myosin can bind. Right? This is the cross bridging. That's, that's occurring. All right, let's see how we're doing right here. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about calcium. So what is, so calcium, remember I mentioned, it's stored in the, the, in the um, muscle fiber, this is the sarcolemma. Remember the sarcolemma? We have the T tubules. This kind of light blue is this tubular structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There you can see the thick and thin filaments behind it. The purple is the thick with the myosin head. The red is the thin filament. So if we have calciums inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, why is it, how is it getting out? Well, we have a channel it's called a ryanidine receptor. It got that name because ryanidine is also an agonist for that receptor. What actually happens when a muscle cell is stimulated, this triggers the opening. So if this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum right here. So what we're looking at right here is another view of this structure. When the muscle cell is stimulated, Electrically, this triggers the opening of this, which is the ryanidine receptor, which allows calcium to leave. Calcium leaves, goes to troponin, which pulls tropomyosin away, allows myosin to bind to actin. That's kind of the story. The term is terminal cisterni. It just refers to just where in the sarcoplasmic reticulum most of the storage is. It's right in that area. So we're gradually piecing stuff together, but I'm, I'm going to add one more element to it so you can kind of take a look at really at the big picture. So from start to finish, what's going on with muscle contraction, at least at this level? So here we have our somatic neuron storing acetylcholine, right? It's going to release acetylcholine that's going to bind to the nicotinic receptor at the motor end plate. This is going to trigger an influx of sodium. Remember, it's a ligand-gated ion channel or an ionotropic receptor that's going to cause depolarization along the membrane, and that depolarization is going to spread all the way down the T-tubule. When that depolarization, as a result of the activation of the nicotinic receptor, goes down the, the um, T-tubule, it activates another protein called the DHP receptor. This is an electrically sensitive receptor that when the membrane gets depolarized, this receptor kind of vibrates. That receptor is in direct contact with the ryanidine receptor. When this DHP receptor vibrates, not the most scientific term, but it tickles the ryanidine receptor, which causes it to open up. There's the DHP receptor, there's the ryanidine receptor, and now it's opening up. 
All right. So let's take a look at kind of the, the, the steps involved here. So again, sort of it's repetitive, but sometimes repetition is good. Here's our neuron. Acetylcholine comes down, or acetylcholine's inside these synaptic vesicles. By mechanisms you already know of, acetylcholine is exocytosed into the synaptic cleft, binds to a nicotinic receptor, which leads to an influx of sodium. That sodium travels like a wave, domino effect, down the sarcolemma, down through the T-tubule, causes vibration of the DHP receptor, which ultimately will tickle the Ryandian receptor. Now, this is in a rested state where muscles relax, so we're not getting that yet. This calcium is still stored. Okay. Once the, T, once the DHP receptor tickles the Ryandian receptor, you can see calcium comes out. Calcium comes out through that Ryandian receptor, binds to troponin, opens up the binding site, myosin, now that it's energized due to ATP, interacts, the myosin pulls on the actin to shorten the sarcomere. Now, of course, we know with homeostasis, right, we have to come back to where we were. Things have to go full circle. So the calcium that was all out here, we don't want the muscle to stay contracted all the time. But once it's out, it needs to come back in. And it's actually pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum through a protein known as calcium ATPase, also known as CIRCA, which actually stands for the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. So CIRCA is a bit easier to, to say. Pumps it back in, and now we're ready for the next contraction. All right. So the muscle contracted. Well, obviously it needs to relax. Now we just saw the first state of that relaxation, one of that states of relaxation where calcium is pumped back into the SR. But we also have to see some other things happening. The ryanidine receptors have to close because we don't want more calcium come out. We need the DHP receptor to go back to its original position, which was like right like that. We don't want it like that, right? Um, the acetylcholine esterase needs to recycle and degrade recycle acetylcholine, and this leads to a cessation of action potentials. So it actually happens in top-down order, but you can see everything from the, the relaxation occurs every, every step of the way from the, the um, nerve stimulation, release of calcium, and then the calcium comes back where it's, where it's returned to the SR. All right. So one of the things, and, and we're going to talk also more about this tomorrow, um, there's two different types of muscle, of contraction of skeletal muscle primarily. And you've heard of them, many of you guys, especially if you do uh, workout training and stuff like that, is isometric and isotonic. Um, and a lot of it has to do with how much force we're applying. Typically, if, if little force is applied to a muscle, it's not enough to overcome resistance and the length of the muscle doesn't change. You might feel some tension. So say, for example, when I'm going like this, oh, you, well, you can't see. But say, for example, if I'm holding my arms out like this, there's tension, but there's no shortening of the muscle. That's isometric. However, if I generate force and flex, I'm applying enough force to shorten the muscle fiber. That's isotonic. Okay. Now, a lot of this has to do with what we call elastic elements. Think of it as like, I don't know if they had it when you guys, when I was a kid, they had this little toy called Slinky, where it was like a, this, it would go down the staircase, and it was like this coiled metal thing. Um, so at rest, this is what we have. We have our sarcomere, Z-disc, Z-disc, thin um, filament, thick filament. If we're in the, doing an isometric contraction, what's happening is you can see that the sarcomere, right, is not really, it's showing it, it's like shortening a little bit, but the elastic elements which are actually opposing that pulling this way, 
they're pulling it back out. So overall, you're not getting any change. As you pull in, the elastic elements are pulling out. That's isometric. With isotonic, and we're just going to talk about concentric, there's eccentric. We're not going to worry about that. Um, concentric is where there's enough force applied that you can, you're able to really effectively, dramatically shorten the length of the muscle fiber or the, the sarcomere. The elastic elements are pulled taut and the whole muscle shortens, whereas here, the muscle basically stays the same. This is just another example of isometric versus isotonic. Um, here with isometric, you might get the, the, the sarcomeres may shorten a little bit, right? Oops. But because of the elastic elements, you're not getting any shortening of the muscle. Here you're getting shortening of the sarcomere, which is so strong, you're also getting shortening of the muscle, which is shown right there. And we'll talk more about this tomorrow. All right. So another interesting story I want to mention to you too, well, it's not really a story, but just some features of muscle, is that not only do we have different types of contraction, but not all muscle fibers are the same. Muscle fibers are, we have basically three types of muscle fibers that are classified based on contraction speed, how fast they contract. Um, and the names are indicative. We have what we call a slow twitch muscle fiber, also known as type one or red. We have fast twitch muscle, also known as type B or type X, also known as white muscle. And then we have an intermediate muscle. Most a fiber, most of the muscles in our body contain a mixture of all three types. Like this diagram is showing right here. This is a cross section through a muscle in a rat, and don't worry about the staining, but this is a type one muscle, this is a type two A muscle, and this is a type two B or X muscle. So it's kind of a, a mosaic of different fibers. So why do we have these different fibers? I mean, why do we have three different types? Well, as it turns out, they, they differ in some of their properties. Primarily the focus is gonna be on type one and type two X type B and X. Type 1, also known as red muscle, versus type 2X, also known as fast twitch or white. Um, type 1 is a smaller diameter, smaller muscle fiber. Type 2X or white, that's what that stands for, white and red, is larger. So we have a differences in the diameter. If you look at them through cross-section, this is the fi this is a white muscle fiber, and this is a red muscle fiber. I don't know if you can see the separation. These are the muscle fibers. This white area is actually the endomycium, but these fibers are smaller. So small muscle fibers in, with slow twitch, uh, large muscle fibers with fast twitch. And of course, as you might expect, fast twitch, slow twitch, this is a slower muscle, this is a faster muscle. Why is this called red? It has myoglobin. Much like um, hemoglobin gives blood the red color and hemoglobin functions to carry oxygen, myoglobin functions to carry oxygen in type one muscle. All right, so that's just a little teaser. Let's go into more detail about these different types of muscles, fibers. Um, like I mentioned, whole muscle consists of mixtures. A lot of it's genetically predetermined. Um, but having said that, um, and we'll learn, if we don't get to it today, we'll cover it tomorrow, um, that it is possible due to, with, with, depending on what type of exercise you do, that you can get a conversion of one fiber type to another. All right. All right. What do we know about slow twitch muscles? So there's various names for it. Slow twitch or um, type one muscle is also known as slow oxidative muscle. Reason for that is because its source of ATP is oxidative phosphorylation, Krebs cycle electron transport chain. Um, they have a lot of mitochondria. Think of oxidative um, respiration, right? They're also very vascularized. A lot of 
blood vessels. And I've got a couple tables coming up so you can kind of put this together. The type 2X or 2B muscles, also known as fast glycolytic, glycolytic, think of glycolysis, that's anaerobic. Anaerobic, we don't need mitochondria, right? Glycolysis, we don't need. So we have few mitochondria, less vascularity, but they're larger. And then we've got the what we call the fog muscle, <laughs> fast oxidative and um, glycolytic. So this is kind of a mixture, an intermediate of type 1 and type 2X as far as size and metabolic function. So let's take a look at some tables um, in, in just a bit here. All right, so I mentioned metabolism. Muscle contraction is a very energy expensive process. Um, requires ATP, right? So depending on the type of muscle, we're gonna use different types of AT, uh, different sources of ATP. With slow twitch muscle, primarily, we use oxidative phosphorylation. And you guys might remember from other classes that generates roughly, what, 32 to 36 ATP per cycle. So a lot of ATP are generated. Glycolysis is the, is the energy source to generate ATP with the anaerobic pathway, which is the fast twitch muscle. And that typically only generates what? Two. So we generate a lot more ATP with oxidative phosphorylation than we do with glycolysis. And the reason for that, as we'll learn shortly, has to do with endurance. Creatine phosphate is something that's common to muscle. This is actually, it's one creatine phosphate is able to generate one ATP, so it's kind of like a one-to-one, -one. Um, but it's a, it's a way to get energy quick. So all muscles do this. So it's not confined to type one or type 2X or 2A. All right. So let's take a look at some properties of fast twitch versus slow twitch. Uh, a little humor here. I, and again, I didn't do this picture. It, I found it on, on Google. Someone photoshopped it, I guess. Um, this is showing these guys running or, or a race. Um, they're at the end of a long race. Uh, when you're looking at long races or the, be, the ability to sustain muscle contraction for a long period of time, it's what we call endurance. And this is where the type one muscles are very effective. Um, and if you think of why, one aspect is they've got, they generate a lot of ATP. They've got a lot of lasting power. Contrast type two X muscles, right? Um, don't have a lot of, don't generate a lot of ATP. But remember these muscles are very large, right? They, they're more powerful. So if you think of events such as sprinting where you need an explosive start or with weightlifting, where you need a fast explosive start, a lot of power, that's where the fast twitch fibers come in handy, right? So here we've got endurance, here we've got fast and strong. Now, to expand on that, these endurance muscles don't really have a lot of power because they have a small diameter, less actin and myosin cross bridging. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the properties. First of all, they're red fibers. Why? They got a lot, a lot of uh, mitochondria, but also primarily because of, of myoglobin, it gives it the red color. Utilize aerobic respiration, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, because of all the ATP they're able to generate, this muscle is considered to be relatively fatigue resistant. Um, that's not saying that it can't fatigue, but it's got lasting power. Very good blood supply, which makes sense because we've got a lot of myoglobin that can carry oxygen that's delivered to it by the blood supply, carries it into the interior of the muscle but it's small. So we have a, a endurance muscle that doesn't generate a lot of power, which is fine. You know, certain times we, we need that. In contrast, fast twitch type 2B or 2X, and I think now they've even uncovered a third type of fast twitch, um, type 2D. But anyway, we'll just stick with the main aspect here. 
These are white fibers, again, because they have very few, um, very little um, myoglobin. They utilize anaerobic metabolism, few mitochondria, and of course the, the metabolism they use is glycolysis. Glyco the substrate for glycolysis is glycogen, right? Whereas the main substrate for um, aerobic is fatty acids. So we've got a lot of glycogen in these types of fibers. Poor blood supply, we don't need a good blood supply. Remember, we, we don't need oxygen, very, or very little. Um, it's a very powerful muscle because it's very large, but because we only generate a couple ATP, it's also highly fatigable. And finally, here we've got this intermediate muscle, which is kind of somewhere in between. And we're genetically programmed. How are, what, what proportion of our muscle, of our fiber types? Some people have family, their families a long line of sprinters. And maybe it's be, because many cases when they do biopsies, these families have a large proportion of white muscle. So it just depends. All right. So let's take a look at some of the, the, the properties. Um, and let me just see where we're at here for a second. And let's see what I, I'm going to wait for. Um, hold on one second, share screen. Um, oh, wow, I've got to get out of that here. Let's see, share screen. We are oh wow, okay so i'm I'm gonna um you know, I'm gonna leave it here, I think, okay, let me just back up for a second here. apologize for this. There we go. Okay. So we've just gone over a bunch of different um, features of the different muscle types, skeletal muscle. So I'm just going to run through this, and then um, we'll see what the time is, and we might stop and then continue with some of it tomorrow. I'll, I'll kind of see. All right. So let's take a look. What I want to focus on primarily is the difference between slow twitch and fast twitch. We're going to just for now ignore the middle one, all right, and kind of learning why these muscles have different properties, okay? So for, I'm going to go over a couple of them. First of all, here we've got um, red, uh, slow twitch is red, fast twitch is white. Small fiber diameter, large fiber diameter. Vascularized, a lot of capillaries, very few. No glycolytic, this is glycolytic, this is oxidative, this is non oxidative. Force developed per area, that has to do with the power. Remember, slow twitch is not very powerful compared to, fa to fast twitch. Okay, what else? Myoglobin content, this has a lot of myoglobin, this has very little. A lot of my uh, mitochondria, very little. Resistance to fatigue, in other words, you know, how. How easy, it is for, for, how easy is it for a muscle to fatigue? Well, in the case of fast twitch, they have a low resistance to fatigue. Remember, they fatigue very easily. Whereas type one, it, because of their endurance, it's harder for them to fatigue, okay? Um, I'm gonna go over a couple things just to kind of give you an idea. So the question is, why is, is type one called fast slow twitch? And why is type two X called Fast, why do we have fast twitch and slow twitch? I've covered different properties, but I have not yet addressed why one's fast and why one's slow. The reason why has to do with two primary things. Number one, the myosin ATPase. That enzyme that, that's on the myosin, it operates very slow in slow twitch. That same enzyme acts much quicker in type 2X. So that explains the faster generation, the faster energizing, faster breakdown of ATP in this muscle. So that's one part. The other part has to do with after the contraction is over, the calcium uptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
the fast twitch muscle returns the calcium much quicker because the calcium ATPase is operating much faster. So this muscle contracts faster and relaxes quicker. This muscle takes a while for it to contract, but it also takes a while for it to, to relax. It's a slow twitch. So hopefully that kind of explains that. We can go over it again tomorrow. Um, now, this is taking a look, again, the same sort of thing. Here we have slow twitch, type one. Um, the AC calcium ATPase is slow. The type two X muscle, the calcium ATPase is fast. The difference in the myosin ATPase activity has to do with different isoforms. The myosin isoform, the, in other words, type 1 and type 2X have two different types of myosin. They're both myosin, but they're different. The type 1 muscle has what we call a type 1 myosin heavy chain. That is slower. That generates AT, that generates energy much slower. The type 2X has a myosin heavy chain 2X, which breaks down ATP much quicker. All right. I think we're gonna get close to finishing here. All right. Finally, just taking a look at the fatigue, a type one muscle. This is just showing an experiment over an hour where, to, where a muscle was subjected to stimulation. You can see with type 1 muscle, over the duration of the experiment, one hour, it stayed, the, the level of contraction stayed the same, maxed out. Type 2B or type 2X petered out very quickly. And type 2A, it's kind of somewhere in between. Oops. All right. Um, this is just kind of a fun little diagram showing if you take a look at yourself, what type of athlete you are, if you're an athlete, whatever. Um, they've taken biopsies of, for example, primarily leg muscles, different leg muscles, to take a look at the proportion of fiber types. And you can see, for example, when you're looking at extreme endurance athletes as well as marathon runners, they typically have a high proportion of type 1 muscle. Um, looking at the other extreme with sprinters, we have a high proportion of type 2X or type 2A, which makes sense, right? Sprinting, fast, explosive muscle. Now, what's interesting is these people, we don't know if that's the muscle that they had to begin with or through training, which we'll learn about next time, you can actually get a, select, a conversion of one fiber type to the other. This is one part that's very um, interesting, unfortunately very sad, is people that suffer spinal cord injuries, um, because there's damage to the somatic neurons, there's muscle atrophy, and that muscle atrophy primarily affects the type one muscle, which is the endurance muscle, which explains why people, again, who in those, who have those neurodegenerative conditions, um, they, it's hard for them to move any, for any length. They, 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 they can't even with assistance. So there's a lot of interest now, and we'll talk about it next time, being, uh, figuring out ways how, especially in people who would like to exercise but can't, how to activate their type one muscle. Okay. And we'll also take a look at these videos next time, which I think is actually pretty fascinating stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and stop right there. Um, hopefully you guys found this um, helpful. And let's see, let me go back to stop share. And I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. And I will see you guys tonight's Monday. If you get this recording tonight, look at it. Um, it'll get you up to speed. Tomorrow we'll meet. Um, in the afternoon again, I'll, I'll send you an email in the morning just to confirm.